Wasn't that good, the choir? Yes, it was. Appreciate that, Parker, and for our choir. And uh, as was mentioned, my name is Jonas Taylor. My wife, Colleen, and I are here today visiting, and I'll be preaching to you today and then probably next Sunday also. So I'm glad to be with you. Uh, Colleen and I live in the area around Mount Juliet, just a few miles east of there. And that's where we have lived and, uh, and have served the Lord in pastoral work uh, for probably uh, over 20 of the 40 years that I've been involved, maybe 41 years involved in ministry. A few years ago, I stepped away from vocational work due to some circumstances, and it has actually been good in many ways for me. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, and uh, it's been good for me in many ways because I have been able to visit in churches all over the state and work with churches and come to understand uh, the needs of congregations that are without a pastor. And it's pretty nice uh, having an opportunity to see a different crowd every few weeks. Can you, yeah, you can say amen to that? Yeah. And uh, uh, we have four children and they are grown. We, uh, we have two daughters, one in Wilmington, North Carolina, right on the coast. And we have one in the area where we live uh, in Wilson County. And we have a son who, is, uh, who lives in Birmingham. And then we have a son that lives in Memphis, he and his family. So they are scattered. We, we didn't ask for that. And uh, uh, you, you have to deal with, uh, you have to, we didn't ask for that. <laughs> and, uh, but thankfully, uh, we have a loving family and we've been able to raise and enjoy our children and are thankful that they know the Lord and are stable and are, and are serving Him. And, uh, and so we're glad for that. Uh, also, uh, in, uh, in the work that I have done, I have pastored churches in Wilson County primarily, but I served a church in Chattanooga in the community of East Ridge years ago. And then for six, six and a half years, we lived in, on the eastern shore of Maryland, and I served a church, a First Baptist church up there. And uh, it was a great experience up there, but I got addicted to blue crab meat. If you've ever eaten the Maryland blue crab, it, it does funny things to you, you know. And so we moved back to Tennessee. I had to go to rehab and, you know, get, get over that. And, uh, but uh, nevertheless, we missed the catfish and other things, the southern things while we were there. And then I pastored a church in. Mayfield, Kentucky, and that would be not very well known, except for the fact it was Mayfield which took the brunt of the, the uh, tornado that went through Kentucky uh, uh, a few months ago, and the, uh, the north section of the city, to include parts of the downtown, were completely destroyed. Thankfully, I lived and served just south of the downtown area. And uh, none of my former church members were directly affected by it, but it destroyed downtown churches that uh, that had uh, long-standing ministry there. And two of the three that were destroyed are not building back. So it's kind of a tragic thing to think about that. And Colleen and I have been talking about taking a trip up and spending a weekend just to go up and and visit with former folks and and see the area, and and just uh, be able to have our hearts. Uh, tuned to what goes on when people suffer loss, and uh, so we've we've uh, we've we've talked about that. Nevertheless, good to be here here with you today in um, First Baptist Church in Olinsville. We got lost the first time we came here, and uh, it was because of her uh, her uh, ways. Uh, and they sent us. We 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 took forty six turns from Burkett Road on the. Yeah, on the north side. <laughs> Finally, we got here that day, so hallelujah. You know, uh, we have a neighbor who moved in next door from us, next door to us, and we, we live off the road a ways, and he loves, lives up closer to the road, but he's becoming a good friend and a good neighbor. He came here from San Diego, California, where he spent his entire life in law enforcement. And uh, he's such a happy guy in retirement. And... Uh, he, uh, he went out and bought a lawnmower and started buying equipment. And I think he's nuts. He's doing all this yard work and 
his wife's planting things. And, and uh, last year, uh, you know, he kept me busy just loaning him stuff, you know. And so last weekend, uh, Sunday, he's not a churchgoer, not a believer, he got out and mowed his grass. And that was a, a bad sign because that means that I'm going to have to do that pretty soon, you know. And I, I mow about five acres and uh, have a lot of trees and a lot of uh, chainsaw work, and it's a busy job for me. And in addition to that, my neighbor in the back, uh, his health finally uh, took him down as far as mowing. He's about 91 now, but he mowed until he was in his late 80s. And so last year I agreed to mow his grass. He has five acres too. And so he likes it a certain way. So I'm doing a lot of mowing. And uh, in the end of October, when my last mow was done, I thought, boy, I'm glad of that. Now I got to start that process again this year, which reminds me of a story about a guy who uh, he looked forward to mowing on Saturdays. He enjoyed mowing his yard and uh, and he'd get out and mow his yard mid to late morning, and then he'd take a nap on the hammock underneath the tree. And that was just a Saturday habit for him. And so one Saturday morning, something came up, and his wife had to leave and go somewhere. And uh, she came out back uh, before he could get situated, and she said, Look, I've got to go, and I need you to take care of, the, of the, uh, my, our dog while I'm gone. And uh, got to take care of Fluffy. And... It, it bugged him. He didn't like the thought of doing that. But how do you say no to your wife? <clears throat> when I find out, I'll let you know how to do that. But anyhow, he, he agreed to do it. And so uh, he had the dog there with him and was laying on the hammock and they're all doing well. And, and he fell asleep. But Fluffy didn't fall asleep. And so about 20 or 30 minutes later, he woke up and realized that he had been watching his dog and, and, and he was gone. And so he started calling his name and looking for him and he went down the street, uh, several houses. And finally, um, uh, no, let me back up. I, I made a mistake in this story. So he woke up and it was Fluffy that woke him up and Fluffy was painted bright green. And the dog was green and so then that made him angry and he decided that he would go, nothing worse than messing up a good story. You know what? And so finally he decided he was going to find out who painted his dog green. So he took off and he walked several houses and finally found a man that he saw in the backyard, had a moving van in the front yard and, and saw a man in the backyard painting long furniture. And uh, he went up to the guy and he was mad. The guy was bent over doing some work on a, on a lawn chair. And he said, hey, are you the guy that painted my dog and the guy stood up and he was large and muscular and he said yeah the dog was in my way and I painted him what of it he said I just want you to know that the first coat's dry and you can go ahead and put the second coat on him now if you want to you know <laughs> now now sometimes you hear a sermon and it brings you back agree to do something you didn't do it and then you get, your, you get your dog painted because you didn't do it. The embarrassment. You can imagine what it would be like to have to tell your wife your dog's green. Her dog's green now, you know. Well, there are times that God pokes us and he paints our puppy in a sermon. And I, I want to speak to you today on the subject of lostness, what it means to be lost. And did not coordinate with the uh, Annie Armstrong offering today, but I think some of the things didn't realize today we had 275 million people in our country with no hope, but that doesn't surprise me. It saddens me, but it doesn't surprise me. And, uh, and so I want to talk to you about being lost. In Luke chapter 19, in verse 10, Jesus makes the statement, and he is leaving he is leaving Jericho for the last 12 to 15 mile journey up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you always go up to Jerusalem. Doesn't matter whether you're going north or south because it's 3,900 feet above sea level. And so regardless of which way you approach, you go up. 
and the Jericho Road is a steep road. Well, it's actually a modern highway now, but I have been on the old Jericho Road, and it's a treacherous road, and, uh, and it's steep with curves and, and a lot of, lot of dangers, but he was going to make his way up to Jerusalem. And in the, at the end of that journey, he said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And let's pray together. Father, what a beautiful day you've given us. And Lord, I can say that my heart has been blessed. We've lifted our voices to sing to you and to worship you. And Lord, we are needy in this hour. And we need mercy of God. And we need favor of God. That you would prick our hearts and renew us, Father, in the love of God and the love of those who are lost and do not know Jesus. Father, you can begin a work today in every heart. So I pray that you would get glory to yourself and that you would be honored by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus went out of his way to come from the area of Galilee into Jericho. And the crowds gathered. And of course, you know the little man that climbed up into the tree that came down. But there were only two people unless there were others that were unrecorded, only two responses to Jesus as he went through the city, blind Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus. And Jericho was a popular place. It was a heavily visited place, but it was not a religious place. The, the scribes and the, and the priest would actually go to Jericho for vacation time, but there was not a synagogue and it was not place and so it was amazing to think that going out of his way and only to respond and and so I, I think that's important for us to note particularly because Jesus said very clearly the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost and this is the forgotten issue in the church today we are no longer following in the footsteps of Jesus because we are not seeking the lost. We are thinking about the lost. And we, we are in some way responding in some way to the lostness. But we're not actively involved, personally involved in seeking the lost. Now, we cannot save the lost. Jesus can, Jesus does, Jesus will. We cannot do that. But we absolutely can seek those who are unchurched and present a message to them that some will receive and that some will respond to. And it's a wonderful thing, as Parker mentioned, to be able to hold your hand up and say, I know the Lord. I remember a time in my life when I was saved and I was translated from darkness into the marvelous light. But then we have to understand more about Jesus. Jesus was doing what he was doing because he is one with the Father and he has a heart for lost people as the Father has. Now, in John chapter 3 and verse 16, the scripture is very clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And it's important to note the word, so loved the world. Now, we think about God's world, love for a, a lost world, but we often undervalue the love of God. We don't understand. So I want to take the time and liberty today that sometimes you can't do, but we, we understand that God loves and He is love. But in the, in the verse there is the word agape, and it's a word that was foreign to the Greek culture in, in most regards prior to the New Testament era. In other words, in the culture, if you were looking for words in the culture to describe love, you would find, and unlike English, we, we have one word, love, and we use it in a broad, expansive way. You know, I, I love my wife. I love my Harley. <laughs> uh, I love my Snickers bar, you know. And, you know, it doesn't really give us a lot of insight into what's going on there. We have to really think. But in the Greek language, in the culture, the common Greek and classical Greek, agape 
was very vague and veiled for a reason, for a reason. In, in Greek, the word storge is a word that's used to describe a family love as parents would have for their children, as relatives would have for other relatives, cousins and family members. Oh, she's my cousin. He's my family member. It's that, it's that bond that exists. You can't see it, but it's there in the heart. It's that family love. And that's not, that's not exclusively all that a parent's love is, but it, it's the word that describes that relational love there. And then we have the word phylos, phileo, and it's a word for brotherly love. It's a word for friendly love. It's a word, you know, uh, we're, we're looking at a class reunion and looking back at a lot of class members of mine. And, and I think about the warm friendships that we had and the people that I was close to and we delighted in. We, we leave we leave high school and we go away and we forget a lot of those things because sometimes phileo can be a delight that comes from a, a common experience or a togetherness like you might find in a classroom, you know. And, uh, um, and so uh, recently we were looking to locate a class member and uh, a couple of friends of mine said, well, he's dead, Gary's dead. I said... I don't think he is. I uh, never heard anything about it. I don't think he is. And they said, yeah, he's dead. I know he's dead. So I, uh, I talked to the chairman of our committee, and they said, well, I don't think he's dead either. And there's a guy down in McEwen that's got his name, and I think he's living in McEwen. So I called Sherlock Holmes, and she said, I'll find out. She's back there, and... Uh, She's my research specialist. She's, she's a, and so within a few hours, she found Gary, and he was living in East Tennessee, and he's not dead. Well, I haven't had the heart to tell my good buddy that he's wrong, <laughs> that he's, he's still living. Nevertheless, the reason I mention that is because Gary and I were close in school, and we, we delighted in each other. We had that love, and it, it's a deep love. It can be a deep love. That brotherly love, that friendship, that delight, it can, it can absolutely uh, have depth to it. But that's not agape. And uh, that's not what that is. And then there's the word eros. And we would think of that from a sexual perspective between a man and a woman. Erotic, that's where we get the word erotic. And it's a love with expectation and benefit. And it's common in the culture. But that's not agape. And the reason agape was veiled is because there was no object or action worthy of the word until Jesus came, until God revealed himself as love. And agape love means, it means a value that is placed upon something, somebody based upon the character of the one who's doing the loving. I, I don't know why God valued me as he did and does, but he does. And he valued the human race. For God so loved the world, he placed such a value on this earth and this beautiful environment that we are rapidly destroying. He, he loved this world and he loved the people in this world who he created. God so loved the world, they were valuable in his sight. And so because of that, he said, who will go? And Jesus said, I will go, Father. I will go and fulfill the law and demonstrate who you are to a lost world. I will go and be obedient even unto death, the death of the cross. And to know the love of God in this way, the Father, you've got to hear from the prophet Isaiah. He said, Thus saith the Lord, excuse me. <clears throat> Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the Lord is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him 
as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. He is a man of sorrows, and he is acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and yet the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And then in verse 10, the scripture says, And it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And he has put him to grief because of his love for us. It's, it's almost more than we can comprehend uh, to understand how God values lost people. To the point that he would send his son to die on the cross. And that Jesus would so willfully do the Father's will and not his own. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost and listen to me, nothing has changed. The world is as lost today as it has been. We, we have not improved our spiritual condition or our relationship to God since sin entered into the world. And there will be a remnant saved, but it will be those that God is able to save because the people of God are out seeking to save those that are lost. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, He said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. Now, the issue here is not the path, it's narrow, which would mean that you would walk through one at a time. I had to my, my parents couldn't come to Christ for me. Yours couldn't you. We have to walk one at a time, and we have to enter in to the gate of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say that the broad way, the narrow way. And the, the Greek word there for those two uh, descriptive terms are the word stenos, from which we get the word stenosis, or the narrowing, uh, from a medical term, and it literally means this is a serious matter. One individual at a time coming to faith in Christ. And, and Platus, wide is the gate, and broad is the way, and most people are lost. Listen to me. People are lost. Nothing's changed. They're lost in the world today, and somehow we have gotten so busy that we have forgotten that. It's amazing. And sadly, the people in the world who are lost, they don't know they're lost. They don't know it. Most of them do not know it. Now, obviously, there are exceptions to the rule, and there are people who are dealing with issues from in their own hearts. But for the most part, the Scripture says that the devil has blinded their minds, and they, they don't even know. Now, hypothetically... You could be an individual on a journey and you could be forced to leave the beaten path and go into a heavily wooded area that you were unfamiliar with. And as you went through and went through deeper and deeper, you might be in a perilous situation. But there would be hope for that individual because he or she would remember before they went into the woods, before they got into that danger. And so they would have a chance of getting out and getting through that. But listen to me, if you're born in the woods and you're born in the world lost, the odds are you'll never get out of there. You'll live your whole life and die in a situation like that. And the people we touch 
and talk to and work with and live by, for the most part, they're lost. They're separated from God. And God is speaking to our hearts. Wake up. Wake up. We, we have to wake up and realize that there's a lost world out there. It's a tragic situation because people have been created for eternity. And it's not that people eventually die and go to sleep. No, no. Everybody that's born will live forever somewhere. Somewhere. And the scripture says that unlike the animal kingdom, God has placed eternity in the hearts of people. So somehow they know there's something out there, but they have no way of really knowing what that is or how to connect with that. You know, as your pastor, preacher, preacher here today, I can identify with that. I, I was a terribly troubled young man who on the surface looked really, really okay. And we were blessed to have a family and a home and a good career. And, and, uh, and within, there was something in me that I knew that there was something more. There had to be something more. But I didn't know what that was. Had no idea how to find the answer until the gospel came, until people came and knocked on our door and began to tell us about Jesus. And, and I want you to know, I think it's funny to me, I laugh at it, but I, I'm a, 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 an old locker room sports guy, three sports, and played a lot of sports and hadn't been in church uh, since I was a child. And so the, the night I got saved, I didn't know how to say praise the Lord or ha hallelujah. I said, hot dog! And for a long time in the church, I'm sure they said, hey, there goes that weird hot dogger. He's over there hot dogging because that was my word for joy and happiness. But I had been delivered from darkness into light. And so there was no way not to give glory to God for what he'd done to me. I finally got sophisticated and, and I quit saying hot dog in church. But I hadn't quit at home, you know. And, uh, and so... It's important for us to realize that uh, that uh, people are lost. It's a tragic thing. Um, by the way, in Matthew, it's not a suggestion, enter in at the straight gate. It's an imperative. It's a commandment. And there in Matthew 7, he deals with lost people. And then he deals, and after verse 13, he deals with preachers. And they, you, you remember he said, uh, Lord, Lord, have we, not, have we not preached in your name? Have we not cast out demons and done many wonderful works in your name? And Jesus said, depart from me because I never knew you. He didn't say, I don't know you anymore. People are lost. This is no game. And they're lost. And they're spiritually disconnected. They're, they're walking in darkness. Their minds are blinded. And how they need deliverance more than anything else. And, uh, and I'm afraid to say that we as a church overall are missing the mark terribly. We're missing the mark. People, you know, you, you think about it. I uh, occasionally lose my cell phone. And, and, and I have to admit I'm learning as I grow. And I don't worry about it anymore until my wife tells me how much it costs to replace it. And, and I've lost my keys. And, and I've lost, uh, you know, different things. Wallet, lost a wallet or two. And a uh, and, uh, little angst, little trouble, little sense of concern, you know. Uh, but it goes away. But listen to me, that anxiety that undefined dissatisfaction that never goes away in the heart of a lost person. Never goes away. And they're lost. And, and, and they're dying. In Luke chapter 15, if we go back a couple of chapters, you know the story of the, of the lost sheep. And the shepherd leaves the 99 for one and the woman who lost a coin and she... She doesn't stop until she finds it and the story of the father and the lost son and how he rejoiced when his son came to himself. There is joy in the presence of angels when a sinner repents. This is the church's work. Listen to me. 
Uh, I'm not here to rebuke today, but I could rebuke. But the church overall have missed the mark. We're way off track because the church today with a desire that nobody go to heaven, we, we've watered down the message. And you never hear sermons on lostness or sin or the law. You never hear people pressing the issue of a broken relationship with God. And we found out what kind of music style the people like. And so we've started entertaining them. And we've started telling them how good it is to know Jesus. And all He wants is for us to worship. That is not true. God is the one who saves. And His first priority in saving us is to teach us to serve Him as sons and daughters who serve the Lord. The church today, people are not serving. They're going down and they're getting a fill up and they're going back out into the world. They're not serving the Lord. There are no demands made upon them. I, I think there's a real danger. I think there's a real danger that we're creating a group of believers who have an intellectual awareness and an emotional bond, but they have never, ever been born again. They've never been born again. And if you want to turn to the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs 30 and verse 12, the Scripture says this. And it's such an easy passage to overlook if you don't want to. But the Scripture says, There is a generation that is pure in their own eyes, and yet they are not washed from their sin. And we're living in a world today where you can't say sin anymore. You can't talk about sin. You know, you, you can't. We, we, in one of my former churches, we had to have our constitution and bylaws uh, rewritten to protect us from legal actions. If I stood in the pulpit and made statements about same-sex behavior and transgenderism and all of those things that we, we could be subject to uh, hate uh, uh, infractions and, and, and all of these things. We, we literally re redid things. But, you know, in, when, when Samaritan's Purse went up to New York uh, to help with the COVID crisis there, they were happy to have them until they found out who Samaritan's Purse was and who they identified with, and the immediate public media outcry, get away, we don't want your kind helping us. That's a fact. That's the world we're living in. And pastors have been conditioned not to offend. We want to do seeker services where we find out what they like. And we're doing a disservice because only God can save them. In our best efforts and desires, to make wonderful music and say God has a wonderful plan for your life and all of these things. We're trying to do His work to seek and to save and we're not even doing the seeking now. Churches are going up. It's amazing. It's amazing what's going on in the world today. It's amazing. And yet churches where people come and sing and worship and offer vertical offerings to God and they want to know that people are being saved. We're struggling. And listen, covid did harm to this church. It did harm to every Bible church. Everyone has suffered because of the COVID. But we can't live in that. We've got to go beyond that. We've got to hear the words of our Savior, seek the lost. Seek the lost. Be willing to go out of the way, even to Jericho, to seek those who are lost. Now, let me, let me show you a passage of Scripture this happens occasionally. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 20, in verse 20, I, I trust you have your Bible. And if not, then you ought to get one. And if not, chairman of trustees should write you a ticket when you leave the church today for not having your Bible in the church. Brother McCarthy. I don't need to turn. The Apostle Paul is leaving Ephesus and he's on the journey will take him to a martyr's death. And he is much loving of the elders and the work 
that was done through the ministry there. And he, he said, I've not shunned. In, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 20, he said, I've not shunned to keep anything back from you that you needed that would be profitable for you. And in verse 21, he said, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you might ask me today, Pastor, what are the bare essentials for going to heaven? What are they? And I would say to you, there are two. Repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're living in a world today where we are not making the message clear and we are not demanding that people turn from their sinful lifestyles and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. We've made it so easy that they are not willing to do that. And listen to me, it's a crisis. Are you willing to give up all of the good things that you enjoy? Are you willing to give up the lifestyle? Are you willing to give up all of the perks and the things that, that you might think are just good things and yet they are idols, maybe idols, you know. Cell phones, goodness gracious, how many people are worshiping cell phones today? Huh? You know, you, you could say amen. You didn't, but you could. People got to go to, to uh, rehab to get off the addiction to uh, iPhones. Children are addicted to electronic media. We've got all of these things. What if we spend as much time thinking about the lost as we did running the cell phone and all the media and all the entertainment industry? It's a, it's a difficult thing. I'm not sure what time I'm supposed to quit, but I'm one of those guys, I don't quit till I get done. So, uh, But uh, it's, I want you to know that repentance is the faulty aspect of intellectual, emotional believing. They've never been born again. They've never been saved. And we can make that happen. We can carry enough gospel to them to make them respond. And yet they're never brought to that point of what to do with repentance. And Agrippa said to Paul, he said, almost you persuade me to be a Christian. Almost. And we're living in a world like that today where people are lost. And it's important for us to know that. Well, let me close by sharing a couple of things. I was in a revival in another county. I was in a a interim position in another county a few months ago. And it was a notable church in the county. And they had gone through a difficult time. And I went in there to be an interim. And I'd been there a few weeks. And I got a call. One of the senior ladies had passed and gone to heaven. And so I did her funeral. Never met her, but I did her funeral and met her peers and the ladies that loved the Lord and served in the church there. And I met her son at that time and her daughter and granddaughter. But her son had moved away as a boy. He had been raised in church and he had moved away as a boy. Spent most of his life in Chicago. And when his mother's health failed, he moved back to take care of her. And before he could get her stabilized and, and, and try to help extend her life, she passed. And so I preached the funeral that day and talked about being lost and being saved and how her mother had served the Lord because I would learned that she had. And do you know, after the sermon, I don't remember, two weeks later maybe, her son asked for an appointment and I met with him. And he said, I, I went to church with my mom growing up. And I've been away all these years. And I want to be saved. I don't want to miss heaven. I want to be saved. And I got it, 60, same age as I am. Did I, I didn't tell you the age, did I? Good, well, I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. We got on the floor, and this lost man prayed to receive Christ. He humbled himself, and he admitted he had wasted his life and received Christ. I baptized him, and it was a wonderful thing. Baptizing as an interim is a good thing, and we had two or three others to baptize at the time. And so not long after that, his daughter made an appointment with me, and she said, I wasn't raised in church. But I've been listening, she had been coming to church, and I've been listening to your sermons, and I heard your sermon, and I want to be saved. And so I led her to Christ, 
and baptized her. And then a month or two later, her 10, 11 year old daughter came and she said, Pastor, I'm lost. She had been going on Wednesday nights and hearing the gospel. And, and, uh, and I led her to Christ and later baptized her. Now, the, the, the wonderful thing was no one saw that coming. No one knew that that was going to happen. The church was just functioning and going along. But listen, they had a ministry to children. They had an outreach program. And they cared about the lost. And so God, in His sovereign will, brought this man home to save him, to seek and to save that which is lost. And I tell you what, He's still doing that. Even though the days are difficult, and even though we're fighting the COVID, and even though we're distracted because of all the things that are going in the world, listen, I, I tell this in every sermon, God did not call the church to watch Fox News or get involved with the political struggle. If God wanted to save America, how about that? Flick of the finger and He could save America. Now let me say what He does want. He does want the people of God, and I'm not picking on any particular news station, although I meant one, and, and the one that I mentioned is the one that's most identified with conservative values, most identified with freedom, most identified with those things. And the people of God are thinking, oh, what's happened to our country? I'd like to help. I'd like to get involved. And I'm not saying that's wrong. But we've become preoccupied with politics. And, and we can't change the political climate or the conditions here only God can. Only God can do that. And so pray and be salt in your life. Be light to those that are lost around you and trust God with the government. But listen, be willing to touch base with people who are lost. Because as Parker said, before you know it, there'll be more in the pews here. And there'll be some children running around here in number. And things will begin to be different, and we'll begin to see people even walk the aisle and say, I want to be saved. God's still saving people. He, he really is, you know. And here a year or so ago, both my grandchildren who lived in Dixon, over a period of time, they both gave their lives to Christ, and I got to go and, and baptize my grandchildren. Pastor, let me baptize my grandchildren. And uh, I thought about holding them under for a while, you know, and... and uh, Using my advantage for gain. No, no. Uh, hallelujah! My, my grandchildren came to Jesus. One was born in Ethiopia and one was born in China. And they're both here in the United States. And I believe the Lord brought them here so that they could be saved. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Would you remember that? Would you repeat that? Would you memorize that? Would that be on your heart and on your mind in the morning? Because I promise you collectively, if we develop the mindset that we're about the Father's business and the Father's business is to save the lost, then we'll be prosperous. And the day will come when in the most unusual way, He will glorify Himself by saving lost people in this congregation right here. I've seen it. I've been doing it for 41 years. And, you know... <clears throat> I uh, met my old English teacher in the hospital one day doing hospital rounds. I was in my late 20s, early 30s. I was one of those students that made her hair change color. And uh, yeah, oh goodness. And uh, she looked at me, her name was Miss Beasley. She said, Jonas, what are you doing for a living? I think she thought I would be out on parole. And I said, well, Miss Beasley, I'm a Baptist minister. And without any hesitation or smile, she said, you sure have come up in the world. And I thought, I guess I have. I guess I have. And I barely got through English. Couldn't hardly conjugate a sentence. Found out when I was an adult, I was smarter than I realized. But it took the love of Jesus to take me out of the darkness and out of the lostness and out of the brokenness and put my life back in, in order and give purpose and meaning to it. And listen, I expect everybody here today knows the Lord. 
But it takes more than intellectual faith. It takes more than an emotional experience. It takes a new birth. It takes a, an internal work of the living Christ to make the difference in our lives. Brother Parker is going to come and lead us. And as we sing this morning, if God's spoken to your heart, take that verse, 1910, Luke. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Say, God, help me. God, use me. Help our church family to look for those who are lost. You save them, Father, but we'll look for them. And uh, let's stand together and, and we're going to sing an invitation hymn.